A very good evening friends. I welcome you all to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by the Shankar AS Academy. Today's date is 24th January 2024. Here are the list of articles which we are going to discuss today. So let us get into the discussion. Look at this news article. Tamil Nadu Governor R. N. Ravi expressed the view on Tuesday that India's freedom struggle led by Mahatma Gandhi lost its significance after 1942. He argued that Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose efforts were crucial and without his struggle, India might not have gained independence in 1947. See, this is the crux of the article. In this context, let us learn about Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose and his role in Indian independence. See, Subhash Chandra Bose was born on January 23, 1897 in Katak, Odisha. He was very patriotic and deeply influenced by Swami Vivekananda teaching when he was a school student. Then, in 1919, Subhash Chandra Bose went to England to compete for Indian civil service and he got selected in 1920. However, Bose left the training midway and returned to India in 1921 as he was deeply disturbed by the Jalian Walaba massacre. Upon his return to India, he came under the influence of Mahatma Gandhi and joined the Indian National Congress. See, this is a brief about Subhash Chandra Bose. Now, let us understand Subhash Chandra Bose's role in Indian independence. In 1921, he started working under Desh Bandhu Chitranjan Das, whom he later acknowledged as his political guru. Then, in 1929, when the Modilal Nehru committee decided in favour of dominion status, Bose along with Nehru opposed it, because both of them asserted that they would be only satisfied if complete independence is being granted for India. Then, in 1930, Bose was jailed during civil disobedience movement. He was released from jail in 1931 after the signing of Gandhi Irwin Pact. After the release, he protested against the Gandhi Irwin Pact and opposed the suspension of civil disobedience movement. Then. Bose was elected as the president of Haripura session of Congress in 1938. During his term as the Congress president, he set up National Planning Committee. Then, in the next presidential election to the Tripuri Congress session of 1939, Bose was re-elected. In that election, he defeated Patabi Sitaramaya, who had been backed by Mahatma Gandhi and the Congress Working Committee. Then, during the phase of World War II in 1939, Chandra Bose brought a resolution. The resolution gave British six months of time to hand over India to Indians. He also said that if British failed to give India back, there would be a revolt and there was much opposition to his resolution. So, he resigned from the presidential post and formed a progressive group called Forward Bloc. Then, in January 1941, Bose disappeared from India and reached Germany via Afghanistan. There he sought cooperation of Germany and Japan against the British Empire. Then. In 1942 January, he began his regular broadcast via radio from Berlin. This broadcast has aroused a tremendous enthusiasm in India. In July 1943, Bose arrived in Singapore from Germany and in Singapore, he took over the reins of Indian independence movement in East Asia. He then organized Azad Hind Fauj, which is also called Indian National Army. The army consists mainly of Indian prisoners of war and it proceeded the work towards his India's liberation from British rule. Later, in January 1944, INA headquarters was shifted to Rangoon. Then in March 1944, INA crossed the Burmese border and stood on Indian soil against the British. However, the defeat of Japan and Germany in the Second World War forced the INA to retreat and the INA was not able to achieve the stated objective. See, Subhash Chandra Bose was reportedly killed in an air crash over Taiwan on August 18, 1945. But it is also believed that he did not die in the air crash and lived for many years. But know that there is not much information to be found about him. See, this is all regarding the discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the basics or brief about Subhash Chandra Bose. And in the second part, we saw about the contribution of Bose to the Indian freedom struggle. With these learned points, let us conclude this and take up the next news article for our analysis. This news article from editorial page talks about India's preparedness to tackle its new two-front situation. Here, the author is talking about the challenges faced by India on both its continental and maritime fronts. See, in a common parlance, a two-front situation for India means the threat which is emanating from both Pakistan and China. But with the unrest in the Middle East, especially in the Red Sea, new two-front challenges has emerged for India. With the rapidly increasing naval presence of China in the Indian Ocean, now India should focus on safeguarding both its land border as well as the maritime borders. So, the article suggests that India should leverage global attention on the Indo-Pacific, it should collaborate with the like-minded countries and develop a well-thought-out strategy to address the new two-front challenges. See, 
this is the crux of the editorial in this context let us understand the threat to the security of india using our daily mains answer writing approach okay now let me read out the question for you analyze the multi dimensional challenges posed by external state and non state actors to the security of india also discuss the steps taken by india to counter those threats see this question can be asked in gs paper 3 and the syllabus of role of external state and non state actors in creating challenges to internal security see the question ask you to write about two things in the first part you are required to write about the multi dimensional challenges posed by state and non state actors then in the second part you are expected to write the steps taken by india to counter such threats this is how we are going to plan this answer okay now move on to the introduction part here you can write about the need for internal security in india see india is a rapidly emerging global power so it naturally contends with a myriad of security challenges stemming from both external state and non state actors here the external state actors are government representatives and their agencies whereas the non state actors may include international ngo mncs terrorist and religious groups and hackers etc see they pose diverse challenges spanning from conventional military threats terrorism to modern day cyber warfare that hinders the regional stability of the country some of the multi dimensional challenges posed by external state and non state actors to the security of india are as follows see this way you can link the introduction part with the body part of the answer okay moving on to the first part of the question now first let us see the challenges firstly cross border terrorism external state actors like pakistan is sponsoring and supporting the terrorist organization to carry out the attacks on indian soils For example, 2008 Mumbai terror attacks organized and orchestrated by Pakistan based militants is a prime example of state sponsored terrorism that posed a significant threat to India's internal security. Another example is that a total of 119 drones were shot down and recovered by the BSF in 2023 along the country's western border with Pakistan. Okay, the second challenge is with the insurgency and separatism. See, various regions in India experience insurgency and separatist movements which are fueled by external state and non state actors they primarily aim to exploit the existing grievances of the state for example in jammu and kashmir there have been instances of cross border infiltration and support which is provided by pakistan to the various separatist group this lead to the prolonged internal security challenges in the jnk region thirdly cyber threats see non state actors including hackers and cyber criminals pose significant challenges to the india's internal security through various warfares like cyber warfare espionage and information warfare for example the recent aims ransom attack involving 40 million records and the pegasus software which is developed by the israeli firm fourthly transnational organized crime see india has the proximity to golden crescent which comprises of afghan iran and pakistan so naturally transnational organized crimes like drug trafficking arms smuggling and human trafficking takes place in this region this can undermine the internal security situation in the jnk region and other border regions of india fifthly radicalization and extremism see non state actors including religious extremist groups can exploit the socio economic disparities and religious tensions to radicalize the individuals and promote violence the emergence of groups like indian mujahideen which carried out various terror attacks in india demonstrates the challenges posed by non state actors in promoting the radical ideologies finally the challenges with the maritime challenges see external state actors like china have overseas military bases in djibouti and their presence is growing in pakistan's gwadar port and sri lanka's hamandota in myanmar the kakpu port is constructed by china and it has close proximity to indian navy base in bay of bengal currently china is building ties with maldives also and china is also pursuing with ambitious string of pearl theory so all these possess significant challenges to india's influence in the indo pacific region see these are the multi dimensional challenges posed by the external state and non state actors to the security of our country with this we have completed the first part of the body okay now move on to the second part of the answer here we are expected to write the steps taken by india to counter those threats firstly india has enhanced the intelligence capabilities to preempt the threats posed by terrorisms initiatives like nadgrid prevents the terror attacks with real time access to classified information like banking air and train travel immigration and individual taxpayers 
The CCTNS or Crime and Criminal Tracking Network and System is an initiative of Home Affairs. It is to facilitate transfer and storage of data information between the various police stations. Apart from this, India is using global platforms like RADS or Regional Anti-Terrorist Structure of SEO to expose the state-sponsored terrorism and it is gaining international support in this matter. Secondly, India is actively investing in the strengthening of cyber defense capabilities. For example, the National Cyber Security Policy aims to build a secure and resilient cyberspace. Apart from this, the certain mandates every service provider, data centers, body corporates and the intermediaries to report the cyber security incidents immediately after the detection. Certain provides specific steps and countermeasures to patch the existing vulnerabilities and strengthen the security of those websites. Thirdly, India has collaborations with various international forums like UN, ASEAN, SEO to share the best practices and gain support against the common threats. Fourthly, India meanwhile focusing on socio-economic development to deter the left-wing extremism. For example, schemes like Vibrant Village Program, Aspirational District Program focus on developing villages and border area and include them in the mainstream development. See. The Samadhan scheme has reduced the red corridor areas in the eastern, central and southern part of India where the Maoist insurgency has the strongest presence. See, you can write these points in the second part of your answer. Now, we have completed the body part of the answer. Now, let us move on to the conclusion part. Here you can write like this. The security threat posed by external state and non-state actors are complex and need to be tackled by focusing on creating deterrence as well as boosting the internal security architecture. So, by enhancing intelligence, collaborating internationally, improving cyber security, fostering socio-economic development and enforcing strict law and order, India can build a formidable defense against these complex challenges. Moreover, it is very pertinent for achieving the vision of developed nation by 2047. See, this is all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the various challenges which are posing to our internal security and in the second part, we saw the various steps taken by India to counter the threats. With this learned points, let us conclude this and take up the next news article for our analysis. Look at this news article. The government spending on public projects, which is also known as capital expenditure, is expected to decrease in 2024-25 before the elections. See, India ratings predicts a slowdown in capital expenditure growth to 12% in 24-25. It's down from a higher rate of 37.4% in the current year budget. Moreover, the report also says that the government aims to reduce the fiscal deficit to 4.5% of the GDP by 2025-26. to See, it is compared to the target of 5.9% of the GDP which is being set for the current fiscal year. See, this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us quickly discuss about an important economic term called the capital expenditure from our prelims perspective. Firstly, what is capex or capital expenditure? It refers to the funds allocated by the government for the acquisition, construction or improvement of physical assets such as infrastructure, building, machinery, roads and equipments. It is considered to be protective and growth enhancing as it adds to the productive capacity of the economy and moreover it will generate income and employment in the future. The Indian government allocates a capital expenditure through its annual budget which is being presented by the finance minister. The capital investment outlay has experienced a consecutive 3 years increase, reaching 10 lakh crores. This accounts for 3.3% of the GDP, marking a significant growth of 33% in union budget 2023-24. Okay. Now, let us move on to see the scheme for capital expenditure. See, the scheme for financial assistance to states for capital expenditure first instituted by the Ministry of Finance in 2020-21. This was created in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic. See. The scheme was announced in the budget 2023-24 in continuation of a similar push for capex from the last three years. Under the scheme, special assistance is being provided to the state government in the form of 50-year interest-free loans up to overall sum of 1.3 lakh crores during the financial year 23-24. Okay, now let us see the trends in the capital expenditure as per the Ministry of Finance. See, UP and Bihar are the top two states which have fulfilled the criteria related to capital expenditure and thereby they received a maximum allocation under the scheme in the last four years. Uttarakhand, Haryana, Kerala, Punjab are among the states which have received 1 to 2 percentage of the total amount which was being released under the scheme. Moreover, Andhra Pradesh, Manipur, Punjab have not received any allocation in 23-24 as per the Ministry of Finance. This is because 
these states have not met the eligibility criteria which is being prescribed under the scheme see this is all regarding the discussion in our discussion we saw about the basics of capital expenditure from our plus perspective and in the second part we saw an important scheme for financial assistance to capital expenditure with this learned points let us conclude this and take up the next news article for our analysis look at this news article former bihar chief minister and socialist leader karpuri thakur will be posthumously awarded bharat ratna see the announcement was made on a day before the birth centenary celebration of karpuri thakur begins see it's a prestigious recognition of thakur's contribution to social justice and equality see this is the crux of the news so in this discussion let us revise about bharat ratna and padma awards from our prelims perspective as we all know bharat ratna is the highest civilian award of the country it was instituted in the year 1954 any person without the distinction of race occupation position or sex is eligible for this award know that it is awarded in recognition of the exceptional service or performance of highest order in any field of human endeavor the recommendations for the bharat ratna are made by the prime minister himself to the president know that there is no formal recommendations for this are necessary the number of annual awards is restricted to the maximum of 3 in a particular year on confirmation of the award the recipient receives a sunset which is a certificate signed by the president and a medallion know that the award does not carry any monetary grant see as per article 18 bar 1 of the constitution awardees cannot use bharat ratna as a prefix or suffix to their name however they can add awarded bharat ratna by the president or recipient of the bharat ratna award in their bio data visiting card etc it was first awarded in 1964 to three persons who are they they are dr sarvapalli radhakrishnan dr cv raman and chakravarti rajagopalachari now let us see some interesting exam related facts about bharat ratna see the bharat ratna can be awarded to non indians also as there is no written rule against the same mother teresa a naturalized indian citizen was conferred with award in 1980 non indians like khan abdul jafar khan and nelson mandela have also been awarded with bharat ratna see the award was not conferred posthumously at first but that criteria got changed in 1966 here posthumously means awarded after death an interesting fact is that the youngest bharat ratna awardee and the first sports person to win it was sachin tendulkar in 2014 okay now we have discussed that the maximum number of bharat ratna awards can be given to 3 persons a year but there is an exception it was awarded to 4 persons in the year 1999 this was the only instance where 4 persons were awarded bharat ratna also in 1992 the government decided to award subhash chandra bose with bharat ratna but that decision got criticized due to controversy about his death that was the only time when the award was announced and later withdrawn okay this is all about the facts about bharat ratna now coming to other padma awards see the padma awards is one of the highest civilian honors the award is announced annually on the eve of republic day every year since its inception the padma awards are announced on the eve of republic day except for the brief interruptions during the year 1978 79 1993 1997 now if you look at the history of padma awards the padma awards along with bharat ratna was instituted by the government of india in 1954 during its inception the padma awards had three classes namely pahala varg tusra varg and tisra varg these are subsequently renamed as padma vibhushan bhushan and padma shri through presidential notification in 1955 in this padma vibhushan is provided to people who have rendered exceptional and distinguished service padma vibhushan is provided to people who have rendered distinguished service of high order and padma shri is provided to people who have rendered distinguished services see Padma Vibhushan is the highest in the hierarchy of Padma awards followed by Bhushan and Padma Shri. Here note that a higher category of Padma award can be conferred on a person only where a period of at least 5 years has lapsed since the conferment of earlier Padma award. Let me give a example for you to understand. If a person named Mohan is awarded Padma Shri, then Mohan has to wait 5 years to be awarded Padma Bhushan. However, in highly deserving case, a relaxation can be made by the Padma awards committee. See The Padma Awards recognize the contribution of people in various fields like art, social work, public affairs, science and engineering, trade, literature, etc. See, these are all about the some of the important facts about Padma Awards. See, in this news article discussion, we have briefly discussed the basics of Bharat Ratna and other Padma Awards from our exam perspective. So, with this learned points, let us conclude this and take up the next news article for our analysis. This text and context talks about 
gender equity in education. The topic has gained limelight due to the latest ASR report. The report says that even though girls and boys from the rural India equally aspire to become doctors or engineers, but when it comes to choosing STEM or science, technology, engineering, mathematics courses, the boys who take up STEM courses are more than the girls. In this background, let us quickly go through the schemes which are relevant to gender equity in education. Firstly, understand the difference between gender equality and gender equity. See, gender equality means equal outcomes for women, men and gender diverse people. Whereas, gender equity is the process to achieve the goal of gender equality. See, gender equity recognizes that women and gender diverse people are not in the same starting point vis a vis men. This is because of the historical or social disadvantages. Okay, now let us see the some of the gender equity schemes in India. It includes firstly Samagra Shiksha scheme. See, the scheme was launched in 2018 and is implemented by Department of School Education and Literacy. It subsumes three schemes of Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan, Rashtriya Madhyamik Shiksha Abhiyan, and Teacher Education. And it aims to ensure that all children from preschool to class 12 have access to quality education with an equitable and inclusive classroom environment. To make this happen, the scheme supports the states in the implementation of RTE 2009 Act. And it also strengthens up and upgrades the SERT institutions and other district educational training institutions, which are nodal agencies for teacher training. Additionally, the scheme has been redesigned and aligned with the recommendation of National Education Policy 2020. Secondly, we shall see about Beti Bachao and Beti Patao scheme. See, the scheme focuses on ensuring the safety, survival, and education of girl children. This was launched by the government to address the issue of falling child sex ratio or CSR. Thirdly, CBSC has launched Udan scheme to provide online resources to girl students of class 11 and 12 for their preparation. The special focus of the scheme is to address the low enrollment ratio of the girl students in the prestigious institutions. Fourthly, to increase the participation of women in STEM, University Grants Commission provides super numeric seats in the IITs and NITs. See, this is all regarding the discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the concept of gender equity and in the second part, we saw about the various schemes to ensure gender equity in the country. This is all regarding the discussion. Now, let us move on to the next part of our video that is to discuss the preliminary practice questions. Today, I am having four questions. We are going to solve three of them and one will be a quiz question for you to solve. Let us move on to the questions. See the first question. With reference to the expenditure made by the organization or a company, which of the following statements are correct? See the first statement. Acquiring new technology is capital expenditure. See, from our discussion, we know that capital expenditures are the fund used by the company to acquire, upgrade and maintain the physical assets. So, this is correct. See the second statement. Debt financing is considered as the capital expenditure while liquidity financing is considered as revenue one. See, this statement is wrong because both debt financing and equity financing are considered as the capital expenditure of a company. So, the statement 2 is incorrect. So, the correct option is option A. See the second question. Consider the following statements. 48 eminent personalities have received Bharat Ratna so far. Yes, the statement 1 is correct because as of now, 48 individuals have received the award. See the second statement. As per Article 18 bar 1 of the Constitution, awardees cannot use Bharat Ratna as a prefix or suffix. See, this is correct because as we have seen in our discussion. But they can add prefix or suffix like awarded Bharat Ratna by the President or recipient of the Bharat Ratna. So, we know that second statement is also correct. So, the correct option is option C. See the third question of the day. Consider the following statements with respect to the schemes which are initiated by government. First scheme, NISTA is a teacher training program. See, this is correct because NISTA stands for National Initiative for School Heads and Teachers Holistic Advancement. So, statement 1 is correct. See the second statement. Swanidhi is a scheme to facilitate the artisans to access affordable working loan. See, this is wrong because we know that Swanidhi is a scheme for street vendors. See the third statement. Satya Bama is a scheme to promote R&D in the science and technology. See, this is correct. See the final statement. Manur Darban is a scheme to promote tourism in the rural part of India. See, this is incorrect. Because Manur Darban is an initiative of the Ministry of Education to provide psychosocial support to the students for their mental health and well-being. Know that it was established during COVID times. So, here the statement 1 and 3 are correct. So, the correct option is option A. See, the quiz question of the day is given here. I will post it in the community section. Interested aspirants, go and attempt it. If you like today's video, like, comment and share it with your friends. 
For more updates regarding UPSC preparation, subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy. Thank you very much.